Hey y'all, this is Culture Soup, where tech, culture, and business collide. It's a podcast that spoons up everything hot from social media. I'm your host, L. Michelle Smith, and each episode, we bring you some of the most notable and not yet notable thought leaders in tech, business, and culture. The year was 2019, and it would be one of my last big speaking opportunities before leaving the big company. And most people didn't know it. In fact, there was a little rumor I would find out later that someone thought that I'd already left, but I hadn't yet. It was about two weeks away. I'm talking about the Hidden Figures event that I emceed and hosted with several women in sports who were rock stars, of course. Well, there was one woman that I haven't mentioned until now. Her name, Nicole Brittenreicher. At the time, she was serving as vice president of this organization, and she's still very much active in it, although she's making a move to New York City. She also introduced me that night, and I never will forget how I literally blushed. And what she said stuck. She called me the Oprah of Dallas? Really, girl? Yes, she did. And the place responded. And apparently I must have lived up to it because I'm still hearing about that event to this day. But I want you to meet Nicole Brittenreicher. She's in the sports industry. She's in the front office and she's worked her way to the National Basketball Association. She's in talent management and HR, talent recruiting. And she is also a diversity, equity and inclusion advocate. Nicole has a wonderful story you may find very, very interesting about how she landed in this role. It wasn't without a lot of elbow grease, pressing the flesh pre-pandemic, and making sure that she raised her profile in the circles that could really make a difference. You see, Nicole is a former professional athlete, college athlete and even a high school athlete. But even Nicole learned that simply being an athlete was not going to be the golden ticket into the creamy center of the sports industry, especially as a woman. I want you to meet her today, and you will, Nicole Brittenreicher. She's my friend, and she is a sports recruiting, HR, and talent management professional and DE&I advocate. Let's get it. Hey everybody, I'm so excited to have my friend, the extraordinary Nicole Brittenreicher, who is a part of the National Basketball Association. She is in talent management, she's in HR, she is in diversity, equity, and inclusion. She does it all, everybody, and I'm excited to have her here. Hi, Nicole. Thank you all. I'm so happy to be here. What's up, El Michelle? You know what? Starts and fits, right? Okay, so we thought we had the summer you know, with um, no mask, everybody's getting vaccinated. Well, at least half of us were. And we got a little freedom. And now this Delta variant is around. And ugh. how are you faring? Um, probably the same as you and everyone else. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. We know everybody is approaching this a little bit differently than yes. the next. <laughs> um, I am in the, in the group or the crew that is probably over it like everyone however cautiously winding back what I thought was we're out of the house and into summertime um and you know back to doubling mask and doing what I can as a vaccinated person I'm still trying to get through this yeah um and quite frankly it is interesting as I'm with the league started my job um within the pandemic so I have been working remotely. However, I'm expected to be in the office and residing still in the Big D in Dallas, Texas, relocating to the city. And this is obviously um, lending a pretty fluid experience on when, if, how that's going to happen as I I have a date that I'm 
kicking and screaming and dragging my feet against, <laughs> but someday I will be in New York. Yeah. So y'all just know that the NBA is based in the Big Apple. So and she's down here with us in Dallas in the meantime, where we love her and adore her. We're going to miss her when she goes, but she's on the bigger and better things. We got to talk about how we met. It was about three years ago, don't you think? Oh my gosh. Yeah, I think you're right. The time is so evading right now, right? Yeah. It's hard to gauge. Like in some ways it feels like yesterday and some days it feels like so long ago. Yeah. yeah you, you enlighten first. <laughs> well, let's see. Three years ago, I was about two weeks away from leaving my position. Nobody knew that just yet. There was a little bit of a rumor because somebody hit me later on in that event and asked me, are you still at AT&T? And I was like, how do y'all even know that? <laughs> but um, yeah, we were at the Hidden Figures event out at the Frisco Star. Um, is that what it's called? It's where the Dallas Cowboys yeah. actually practice. Yeah, the Star in Frisco. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Tell us about that event. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I am a proud member and um, leader in different capacities of the Black Sports Professionals. Um, we are a national organization. However, particularly when um, Michelle and I met was here in Dallas in our um, BSP North Texas chapter. And we held a the second annual, um, what is known as the Hidden Figures event in Women's History Month. And quite frankly, um, I'm not surprised by this, but this particular event, <clears throat> excuse me, year over year, is a headliner. It draws, um, you know, tons of attendees and we always bring out the showstoppers. And obviously we tapped you, um, what I, you know, coined as the Oprah of Dallas. Yes, you did do that in front of everybody too. It stuck. Yeah. It stuck like glue. The oh, name stuck. stuck. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So to moderate a fantastic event. So, and that was, you know, no surprises there Our biggest yet. And I think, if you you want to dive in talking to that more, I mean, you springboarded that into particularly on this podcast. Yes. Uh, it'll reach people all across the world. Just the sheer power hitters and women we had present in that was fantastic. And what relationships I made that night that are still carrying through. In fact, Andrea Williams is going to be a part of my next book. Yes, please which is really exciting. She is the oh, chief yeah. operating officer of the college football playoff. Shout out to Nicole Lynn, who just dropped her book, Agent You. Yeah. I'm so excited for her. She's an amazing person. And Dan Danielle Cerency Jones, who's been on the show as well, you know, just and I, I see her everywhere. Essence, you know, Black Enterprise. She's doing it. Amazon. Yeah. yeah. No, and exactly what I would say to that event, um, it was... It was like the pre, y'all were already out coming out in your own senses, but there it was on the eve of all these big, amazing things that everyone then revealed to the world, right? Like yeah. you bring <laughs> out to run your own business. Mm -hmm. Nicole Lynn then drafted, you know, the as a black woman, like the first, um, first round yes. NFL player that mm -hmm. never happened before. Um, Andrea, I mean, she is doing revolutionary things at the CFP in a very yes. tumultuous time. And then, of course, Danielle, as you mentioned, left and right, you look and see what their organization, Power Hands, is doing in the sports industry. So I was just grateful to be there among <laughs> all of you and to be a catalyst and, and getting everyone together in the same space. And, uh, you know, black sports professionals in general, I, I've leaned to the, into that organization as it's been a, a threshold in my career where our mission is to connect and empower and advance us in the industry um, as we are always, you know, and as many industries looking to get more representation in front offices and really help our professionals climb and get there. So. Yeah. Hats off to you and Larry Lundy and all the other leaders there at the Black Sports Professionals Network. What do you think we have a culture soup moment? Let's do it. Absolutely. All right. So, you know, I'm always scanning the feeds. I'm on social media, seeing what people are talking about. And, you know, you just can't get away from what's going on with this coronavirus. It's like it will not go away. How has that impacted the sports industry as a whole? But then let's let's talk about the front office because 
you alluded to the fact that you're here in Dallas. You've been working remotely on this job. Yeah, that is um, a very great question. And quite frankly, one we're tackling and dealing with every day, um, you know, in, in all aspects of the sports industry. And I would say um, if it wasn't clear and apparent, you know, we were hit quite tremendously like many other industries, but we learned quickly that, you know, people come and attend sporting events out of desire, fun, entertainment, right? Like that's not a, a requirement to live your life. So when you think about one, sports going away from a live perspective, because quite frankly, we just weren't having games, but two, games are coming back. However, from a financial perspective, that's not the first thing people are turning to spend their money on. So um, I would say from a revenue standpoint, you know, the sports industry is still looking to find ways to recover, um, to kick claw scream back um, to a stabilizing perspective. And that ties hand in hand to having live events, which we are seeing more of um and it's really quite interesting right like the the nuances to the industries the leagues and the capacities that arenas and football stadiums can be filled up to varies literally city by city state by state so the sheer chaos i would say still insist um for everyone unfortunately however just having the hope of the Olympics even, which how bizarre, right? No yeah. Fans. Yeah. The um, Paralympics are happening more. right now and they just announced that there will be no spectators. Wow. And, and that is just a new concept, um, which I, I think it's interesting on how we will continue to navigate on if there are substantial things that will stick mm-hmm. going forward on decisions on, you know, large crowd events in sports um, until we we truly like come out of the woods with the virus. And that's not something that's obviously happened yet. It's interesting as leaders, we're learning to pivot on top of the pivot. Have you noticed? Like I'm going to my first, I've been invited to my first in-person speaking event here in Dallas on the 9th of September. This is something they've been planning for months. But you start planning when you start to read the tea leaves and it looks like people are getting vaccinated and the virus isn't ramping up. But at that point it wasn't and now it is. So, yeah, you know, they're making sure that everybody's social distance is a room that probably could hold 3000, but we're going to limit it to 300. And now I'm mm-hmm. wondering, what do I do at the end? Because, yes, I'm going to mask up because people come to the stage and they want to speak to you. So, yeah. Am I going to shake hands and just have sanitizer? Like, what am I going to do? You have to learn to pivot on top of the pivot. Yeah, you make a great point. And quite frankly, right, like you'll probably decide what you're most comfortable with. And I hopefully people will support that. Um, To your point, pivot on the pivot. I love that. I'm going to utilize that. You're always pointing (laughs) some one liner statement. Um, I, I think the evolution of the decision making of crisis management of like constant interaction with employees who are scared who are you know angry don't want to return to the office understand why who um you know some employees you see or i'm sorry organizations are handling it very differently Mm -hmm. right and coming from you know a place the mba where i wasn't even a part of the organization they were the first to take that step and the precaution to pull the plug yes, and indeed. protect players, protect the employees and you know i <clears throat> admire the league for so many reasons that being one of them you know the other being quite frankly just them also being the leader in inclusion and really walking the walk when it comes to talent representation, not just on the court, of course, but across our teams and in the front office, which is one of the primary reasons I was attracted to coming into the organization to begin with. Yeah, you know what? That's a really good place to talk about how you got there. Let's talk about your story because you didn't just show up at the NBA. (laughs) There was a journey. And first you made a decision to work in sports. How did you come to that decision? And when did you decide that, you know, front office is where you wanted to be? Yeah, that is a really great question. The second piece of that. Um, So let's take it back a little bit. 
and just set the stage here. I was an athlete. I'm still an athlete. I'm just old and retired now. Like, oh, you are not. Oh, y'all, go (laughs) check out the vacation pics. She's still an athlete. (laughs) Eugene, well, I guess. Um, And I got like I used to. We'll just put it that way. so I competed in all things growing up. I was fortunate to have parents that put me into opportunities that I chose, right? Like you name the sport. And um, when I say that, there's a lot of things I just learned on the Olympics that I'd never been familiar with before this year. <laughs> um, but I literally started playing t-ball at age like five. Um, and, and so softball, swimming, soccer, basketball, track and field, volleyball, I, I if I had interest, if I was asked, if I had the ability and opportunity, I probably tried it out. Gymnastics, you know, as a as a volleyball player, gymnastics didn't last long as I'm a little long for that sport. Um, but got the opportunity to have supportive parents to to really compete and be a part of team sports from an early age. So I knew once I graduated that I would want to pursue a career um, in the sports industry. And I didn't exactly know what that meant, but I played two years of volleyball at um, Ohio State University and transferred transferred to the University of Kentucky. Uh, so I bleed blue all day long. Um, however, I'm from the great state of Ohio and Cincinnati is, is what I claim. And I know mm-hmm. a lot of people try to loop us in together there's a difference between the two states (laughs) she said let me just be clear yes yes um so i got the big 10 experience got the sec experience and had the opportunity to to play uh volleyball professionally overseas at after competing at an elite level in college and um you know leading my team as a team captain for two years at uk and getting to stack up some SEC and, you know, regional honors based on my play, um, continued to compete at the international level in Spain. And um, that was all prior to graduating. With the transfer, I had another year of school to finish. So I decided I could always come back and finish school at any time. Yeah. And the university honored, you know, me returning to do that. So went to play and that's an experience that I quite frankly directly tie back to wanting to be on an airplane or out of the country every day. Yeah. And into live in Europe. So it was that's great. amazing. That's an amazing story and quite a journey that some people only dream of. Yeah. And I, it's so funny you say that, El Michelle, because I literally like reflect often as I'm extremely grateful for the things I've been exposed to or gotten to do that I've done more in my lifetime than some people will ever get to do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so you got to be grateful. It's awesome. Yeah. Which yeah. is and that, how you're extending these opportunities to other folks. Yeah. In your role. I, that's true. And I honestly, I, I've thought often, right? Like, reaching a hand back, um, pulling someone up with, and I've always been an individual that, I don't know if I always have, I've learned, I often enjoy connecting people and bringing great people into good situations, connecting good people with good people, and those who are really putting the work and trying to get access, if they follow up to what they say, if they're seeking and just need an opportunity, a hand, people have lent that to me, right? So I'm fortunate to be in a situation I can continue to lend open doors, advise, refer, um, recommend um, to other great people who have the same abilities and influence to do so. So um, it's it's been a journey, right, to evolve into that space and role over my career. Um, and it's one I don't take for granted, for sure. Good for you. So you had this wonderful career as an athlete and then you pivot, you end up going front office. How did that happen? Yeah. Um, you know, it took, it wasn't just a first application, knock on the door and here's your job and role despite my amazing athletic career. So it took me after playing in Spain, came back, had a year of school to finish graduating Um, completed my degree and 
try to get into the sports industry and I was specifically focused on pro sports. Mm -hmm. I wanted to start in um, the professional league team side, you name it. Um, Thus, I was knocking on doors. I would love to go back and see if I could see how many jobs I applied to just on those random sports sites. Yeah. Get a tally, right? How many like no emails I was getting. Yeah. Well, you keep counting the no's and you get to your yes. Absolutely. Um, And I, what I would say is while I was an athlete, my full-time job was competing and then going to school in class. I did not have the opportunity, the time, the bandwidth to have a job on the outside. That included an internship. So when I had come back and had completed my collegiate eligibility, I was really just back finishing school, right? So I had more time to truly pad that resume, and I did that, whether it was, you know, having overlapping internships at two or three places, whether it was um, working at Applebee's, which is teaches you a lot, especially at the location off the highway that I worked at. Really? Interesting demographic of Mm -hmm. attendees in there. Um, high-end spot, you know, retail. So Mm -hmm. a lot of experiences and work that I was able to obtain all while knocking on the door, attending networking events, um, going to conferences to network with teams to try to get in the door. So uh, the opportunity came to me, not through one of those applications. And this is the the threshold for finding jobs in the sports industry Mm -hmm. still to this day. Um, you know, I had a networking lunch with somebody out of my hometown, connected by my high school high jump coach. Wow. Yes. Who See, they came out of left field because we were thinking volleyball all this time. <laughs> exactly. I told you all the things, right? All yeah. the things. Um, and they had recruited this individual who works who worked for the Cincinnati Bengals who played lacrosse at Syracuse to be the lacrosse coach at my high school. Wow. So they knew he worked for the Bengals. They knew I was seeking a career in pro sports. And that was my introduction um, to this professional. And they weren't hiring. It was just a lunch. Um, however, that lunch ended up being my interview. Wow. And they called me. Um, of all times during the NFL lockout um, <laughs> to come be a seasonal ticket sales representative. How many tickets do you think we were selling then? Not well, you know, kind of like the pandemic right now, right? <laughs> Ex- precisely. Yeah. Like that's a, a great correlation. Um, so, yeah, I got my start with my hometown team of the Cincinnati Bengals. And I remember walking in the halls literally with a huge grin like I have on my face now, just like thrilled and telling myself, you work for the NFL. Like, yes. you work for this. Um, just to like have that great first experience. I try to find bits and pieces of that, obviously, you know, now that I'm, you know, 10, 15 years into my career. Um, Cause you know, people tend to get jaded over time. Mm-hmm. So I'm always trying to find, hold on to the piece of amazingness as sports is still very, high demand. And now I work for the NBA. So yeah. How do you find the strength and energy to remain tenacious to go after these roles? Because it's not like there are a billion of them. Yeah, that's a really good question. And quite frankly, you know this, I know your story. And longer the time you spend in a space doing your job well, making meaningful relationships, being intentional about how you go about, you know, your own personal branding or how you're spending your time, um, your reputation starts speaking for itself. People start recommending you, they refer you, you cross over to work in rooms that they're already in Mm -hmm. and opportunities start organically coming to you. Yeah. And that's, that's how, right? Like, I think it's having the persistent ability to your to go about your life mm-hmm. uh, that is ordained. You know, a little personality and positivity doesn't hurt either. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you're at the National Basketball Association now, and you're in talent management, talent talent recruiting, and um, DE and I talk about that role. Yeah, it's very interesting as all those things plus more kind of encompass my day to day. And I am, am in a role f- 
focused on talent advising and how I would describe it is um, a consultant to our team. So I am out of the league. However, the majority of my time is spent working with all 30 teams across the league portfolio, which is a pretty awesome experience just to interface with every you know, brand, market, conference that you can imagine, all within the front office business side, within the HR human resources perspective. So my day-to-day is, is really focused on helping them be the best that they can be from a localized perspective, but more so from a um, service standpoint. So whether it's bringing best practices, whether it's extending the league side of tools that we have to the teams, whether it's giving them um, access to talent pools and communities that um, my function has created and put together, or even making specific recommendations on candidates for roles that they may have, um, very all-encompassing. And then all of that, plus two other major pieces, um, you know, the talent management piece really focus on learning and development and working with our our executives at the team level to help bring the minds together, right? Like we're creating community among the teams to help them be better. What are you doing locally that somebody else might be able to benefit from? Um, What tools, resources from an enterprise perspective can I bring to the teams to help them thrive and service their employees and their team members? Right. Um, And then that other piece, you mentioned the diversity, equity, and inclusion, which I would say how to best describe that is everything I just touched on and spoke about. I'm going to put the DNI hat and blanket over all of it mm-hmm. and process it through a DNI lens. So, more or less, just to make that easy and simple. Yeah. Um, that's the approach. That's awesome. You know, to be able to work in that role at an organization, which I would say in sports has been probably best in class and leading when it comes to diversity and inclusion. And let's go back maybe five years where you had um, Zing Shaw at the Atlanta Hawks that was doing some amazing work. She's now at the the Starbucks company. And then I think about Dr. Mari Stennett, who was working with the Nets for a while. Mm -hmm. And of course, he's gone on, I think, to Sony or one of the entertainment companies. Um, But, Mm -hmm. you know, it's not shocking that they move on to these huge roles because they did such a great job and they weren't the only ones. Move on up a little bit more and you get the scent marshals of the world at the Dallas Mavericks. And they all are leaving these marks in the NBA to the team's you see people like LeBron and others stepping up in ways that you can't necessarily see in other leagues where it's not necessarily accepted so much. So can you speak to the value that NBA puts behind diversity and inclusion and what separates it from some of the other sports leagues? Yeah. And, you know, I'm putting on the Nicole hat here and the, the personal opinion a bit. Um, outside looking in and as an insider now looking out, there are apparent things that you just referenced that are more in tune from a brand and just culture perspective that come natural to the league. Um, that is very attractive to me as a black woman. Um, and uh, they have set that bar very high for a long time. And I think there's a couple of different things tied to that, right? I think that, um, you know, some of the core values typically are directly associated with inclusion, respect, value, or, um, innovation, integrity, mm-hmm. and all through the DNI lens, like I mentioned before. Um, you can see it in the strategic business nature of how decisions are made. Mm-hmm. And we know by fact, that's how organizations are able to thrive, who truly walk the walk um, tied to diversity, equity, inclusion, as it's not a topic or a book you pull off the shelf um, or a box you're checking. Um, You're seeing it in your business decisions. You're seeing it in your your goals and your objectives on an annual quarterly basis. And everyone in the organization is tied and committed to achieving those. So, this is the first time I've been in an organization to see that really come to life and 
and built from the ground up and it is exhilarating <laughs> let me tell you it's so exciting and awesome um, and the fact that I own projects and programs to help further those goals initiatives and have so much influence on truly changing the nature of our front offices and teams on the business side and having representation and women and roles um, across the organization is extremely exciting to me. That's awesome. And you know, that trickles from the top, you know, Adam Silver must take a real stance in these issues in order to see that trickle down. I, I don't know how often you come into contact with Mr. Commissioner, but is he is he very far away or is he, you know, right down the hall from your office in New York or where's the commissioner? Is he in New York? Yeah, it's so funny. So he is in New York and because I'm still remote and have walked in our newly um, renovated offices once, we have not run into each other yet. Mm -hmm. However, I'm already have my lines ready on when that day does occur. <laughs> um, however, I would say, you know, he, he leads and is in the forefront a lot of our employee team um, organization. And, and by that, like employee resource groups sure. is, um, with the inside the MBA, we often have calls where the collective is all MBA employees are coming together and um, words are not minced, right? If, if there is something that's happened that's impacted employees of a particular ethnicity or race or just underrepresented group, um, that's acknowledged. When the shootings happened, um, I believe it was in Georgia, um, to Asian Pacific Islanders, that was acknowledged and it was called out and was spoken by the leader of our organization, mm -hmm. right? Um, I mean, I remember a group, that particular event where, you know, Asian leaders from across the MBA were brought together to help create a space for everyone, supporting allies, um, people who identified with that particular group. And then um, Adam Silver kicked it off, just acknowledging how it's not tolerated, how this is directly tied <clears throat> to our work at the MBA, um, how what we're trying to do across our um, teams, leagues, and market is partnered directly with community influencers, leaders, government officials, um, to really help change the makeup and decisions and just everyday interactions among people. So, um, and, and I would say that was after he acknowledged the shooting of another black man in um, Minnesota. So yeah. conversations like this coming from a leader, like was my jaw dropping? Was I doing praise dances? Was like shocked absolutely like all those emotions and yeah. then just the sheer nature of I work here is why you know I have learned to intentionally choose culture and organizations based off what align with your values and have found one that um I can say does both amazing Nicole what projects are you working on now that you could talk about that maybe you'd want to share yeah, absolutely. One that's very exciting that you'll hear launched um, here soon, and by that, like this week we tip off, is the MBA's Future Analytics Stars program. And I have a class of 65 upcoming stars in the data analytics space. Wow. Um, all come, yeah, primarily um, we have operated an inclusive recruiting process where you're going to have every um, woman, you know, diversity backgrounds tied to all races incorporated. And we are creating a space where um, they can receive tools for professional development to find roles within the league would be a dream. However, this is modeled after our future sales stars program. And we have been able to springboard individuals into careers all across the sports industry, major brands, major company organizations. So I'm um, excited for that. And um, some other things are also tied to the to the DNI piece, but it's more so retaining and advancing employees who might be stuck in particular areas and not advancing within their organization. So all talent management, L and D, HR, D and I, you know, all amazing. Things. Well, and if you ever need any support from a coach, facilitator or speaker, I would love to work for an organization like that. Yeah. 
Um, and you know I know your skills and gifts. And <laughs> I'd endorse you any day. So I will remember to keep you in mind. That was a shameless plug, wasn't it? <laughs> it yeah, not so shameless. Sound hey, you know what? Shoot your shot, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Nicole, it's so awesome to have you. Where can people find you online and follow you? Yeah, absolutely. You can LinkedIn, probably the best place, Nicole Britton Riker. Um, I am an avid user and can be found and contacted there. That's probably the best place. Awesome. Nicole, thank you so much for joining us on the Culture Suit. All the best to you. And you know what? We, we're selfish. We want to keep you in Dallas. But you know what? I want to give you your wings and see you fly. So the Big Apple, you know, they're lucky to have you. I appreciate that. You always have a place to visit and I will definitely be back in Dallas every opportunity I get. Awesome. I can't wait to get back to the Big Apple. I used to go like at least four or five times a year on business. Yeah. yeah. I haven't been doing okay. much of business travel at all. I know that, you know, the Delta Gammas of the virus. Just yes. Time, so. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on, Nicole. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Mwah. Bye. Love you. Love you too. The Culture Soup Podcast is a production of No Size Communication, LLC. The Culture Soup Podcast is a registered trademark of No Silos Communications, LLC.